name is Jesse Rankin. I work at St. David's Children's Hospital in the ER there. I'm a pediatric ER physician. Um, I got the topic of pediatric respiratory distress, which is somewhat broad, <laughs> but we're going to hit the highlights. And I called my brother-in-law before I started this presentation because he's a paramedic in L.A. County. And I said, so what would you want to know about pediatric respiratory distress? And he said, basically, you want to know how not to F it up. <laughs> so I said, that's so great. We have similar motivations. This is awesome. So uh, we're going to have some objectives today. So try to recognize the different presentations of pediatric respiratory distress because they vary from an adult presentation of, of respiratory distress. We're going to discuss just kind of like the heavy hitters, the things I feel like we see all the time, right? So croup, anaphylaxis, bronchiolitis, and asthma. And we're going to try not to F it up. So, <laughs> All right, so a couple things we need to think about in terms of what's different about the pediatric airway versus the adult airway. In general, everything is smaller, but what, the, what is there is bigger in a smaller space, right? So your nasopharynx is smaller. It's more easily occluded, as are your nares, right? So infants are obligate nose breathers. So anytime their nose is congested, they're going to be having some respiratory distress, right? Their tongue, their tonsils, their adenoids, those are all really big in relation to their oral cavity, right? They have a really long floppy epiglottis. It's going to be more vulnerable to swelling, like you'll see in croup. And their larynx is more superior and anterior, which sometimes can make an intubation a little bit more difficult. We're not really going to get into intubation and um, that kind of thing today, but just something in general to know. Um, and then their cartilage, their tracheal cartilage, is really floppy. It's not well developed yet, so um, it's easy to collapse when their neck is flexed, which is why sometimes it's a lot better to kind of have them in the sniffing position so that airway is patent and not compromised in any way. Um, the other thing to think about is they're not just different anatomically, they're also different physiologically, right? So increased metabolic rate, increased oxygen consumption, increased ventilation, they have very small lung volumes. This all equals the potential for really rapid decompensation, right? They're like fine until they're not, and you're just like, thanks for the warning. That's awesome. Appreciate that. So you just kind of have to remember that. Um, and unlike in adults, where usually it's a primary cardiac event that's going to uh, lead to a cardiopulmonary arrest, in kids it's usually a primary respiratory event. So we just kind of have to really mind our P's and Q's when we're dealing with these kiddos. Okay, so let's work on recognition. I hope these videos play, but we'll, we'll find out. It'll be fun. Okay, so in general, it's really important to just recognize what you see, right? I always teach residents, like, you should walk into a room and decide in, like, five seconds if that patient is sick or not sick, right? So you guys can do the same thing. It's not, it's not rocket science. So observe the child. You know, what do they look like? Are they alert? Are they playful? Or are they completely listless? And parents always say the word lethargy, right? It's like the most top, and the kid, like, running around the room, and you're like, okay. Great, that's a, that's a buzzword, right? But listless, are they responding to painful stimuli? Are they, are they mad at you when you're poking them and prodding them? I like it when kids are crying and mad. A crying child is a child that's breathing, right? So remember that. Um, this is what really scares me. Anytime you have a kid with respiratory issues and they are somnolent or they are starting to, their mental status is starting to kind of wane, you're in trouble. That's probably a sign of impending respiratory failure, okay? Okay, so different signs of respiratory distress. So your first sign you're going to see, and you're going to see this early on, is tachypnea, right? And it's just important to remember that kids, in general, will breathe at different rates, and there's different normals, depending on how old they are. So good rule of thumb is um, if they're a neonate, it's probably usually around 50, 50 times a minute. If they're less than six months, it's usually around 40. If they're a year, it's usually around 30, right? So try to keep that in mind when you're dealing with these kiddos. And um, when you have these kiddos who are breathing really hard and fast, and then they start to breathe slow and they get more lethargic, that's when we're also heading into that danger zone. Okay, so, oh yeah, it works. This is exciting. Um, so retractions, right? So this is something you're gonna see in kids. So they can retract in all kinds of different places and sometimes where they're retracting can give you an idea of where they're having an obstruction, right? So. Babies are trying really hard to overcome this airway obstruction, no matter where it is. So they're gen generating really high negative intrathoracic pressures, and that's causing their soft tissue in their chest wall to kind of sink in. So that's what you see, right? Um, in general, supraclavicular retractions or suprasternal retractions are kind of more of an indication of an upper airway obstruction. 
and then your intercostal and your subcostal retraction are in general more indicative of a lower airway obstruction, okay? So I know you guys have all seen this, right? And then you've seen the kids that are just like retracting to their spine and everything is it's just not good. So everybody's seen this, right? Yeah. So another thing that mostly just babies do is head bobbing, right? You guys seen this before? Yeah. So why do they do that? So they're just trying to generate more negative intrathoracic pressure to get more air in their lungs, right? Because they're obstructed. So contraction of their neck muscles is going on in order to assist ventilation. And since their neck extensor muscles aren't very developed yet, their head falls. So that's kind of what's going on. And they're just exhausted from breathing so hard. I don't like those. I don't like head bobbing. Not a fan. Nasal flaring. You've seen this a lot, I'm sure, too, right? So basically, the, they're just trying to decrease the airway resistance by opening up other airways bigger, right, to get more air in. So we'll see that a lot with infants as well. And like we said, the little ones, they tend to breathe through their nose more, so any level of obstruction in their, in their nasal pharynx is going to give them some difficulty. Tracheal tugging, I know you guys have all seen this, and this is what we're going to usually see in croup, right, or some kind of an upper airway obstruction. Uh, this is your supersternal retractions. You just kind of see them sucking in right here above their sternum. You guys have seen this? This is the one I really don't, don't like. Especially since tis the season, we're in the middle of RSV, right? So... Basically, these kids are trying to create their own peak. They're trying to create more uh, positive end expiratory pressure when they're breathing out to open up those alveoli that are collapsing on expiration, right? So they're trying really hard to get air in and out. And, and this is kind of an ominous sign. And you're going to see this more in lower respiratory tract disease, like bronchiolitis, that kind of thing. You guys have seen and heard these things, right? Yeah. You can also see how this kid is sitting, right? So kids are going to kind of tripod a lot when they're having an airway obstruction. They're just trying to align everything as much as they can to get the most air in. So you're going to see them kind of neck, neck extended out and kind of leaning over a little bit, right? So that's pretty common as well. And then I know we've all heard this before, Strider, and you hear this a little better at the end of the video, but... This is a high-pitched noise, right? You usually hear it on inspiration. You usually don't need a stethoscope to hear this, right? You can hear it from across the room. Um, and this usually indicates narrowing in your upper airway. There's turbulent airflow going in because of that, and you hear this noise, okay? It can be inspiratory strider. You can have expiratory strider. You can have biphasic strider. And that kind of helps you kind of judge the level of obstruction or where the obstruction is occurring, right? Inspiratory is usually going to be above your vocal cords. Expiratory is going to be below. Okay. And kids with, you know, really true strider and respiratory distress, they give me a little anxiety. I don't like upper airway obstructions. <laughs> but of course, on the outside, we pretend like everything's cool. Okay, this is embarrassing. I couldn't find a picture of a human with Sturter. So this is a bulldog. <laughs> okay. So Sturter, I just wanted to bring this up because Strider and Sturter are sometimes very easily confused. Sturter is more of an obstruction of your nasal pharynx. It's like snoring. Okay. I know this dog is like really having a nice dream. But um, it's more lower pitched. It's like a snore as opposed to the higher pitched Strider that you'll hear. And the obstruction here is above the larynx and usually in the nose, right? Um, a lot of times, though, it's kind of hard to tell. Like a kid who's really congested and stertorous sounds almost like Strider sometimes. So try to, try to remember this video, <laughs> this bulldog, when you're trying to differentiate between the two. Um, strider, like we said, it's going to be more high-pitched. Um, it is usually a level kind of above the vocal cords that you're, you're seeing that obstruction. Sturder is more lower-pitched. It's more snoring. Um, and it's usually in the nasopharynx that the obstruction is kind of occurring. Okay, so let's kind of put it all together. So upper airway obstructions, you're going to see nasal flaring usually, you're going to see strider, you're going to see tracheal tugging, you're going to see stertor, okay? 
lower air obstructions, this is where you're going to have more of your wheezing, you're going to have grunting, you're going to have subcostal and intercostal retractions, right? So let's talk about the potential differential diagnoses for these things, right? So for our upper airway obstruction, croup, probably the most common thing you'll see, right? Epiglottitis, not as common right now because of uh, the Hib vaccine, but we do have some non-typable H flu that can cause epiglottitis, but not very common. Anaphylaxis, obviously. And then in terms of our lower airway diagnoses, we have asthma, we have bronchiolitis, we have pneumonia. Um, and there's tons more, but I just wanted to kind of hit, hit the most common things you guys are going to see. So these are the ones we're going to talk about today. Okay, so moving on. Croup. So it's the most common cause of acute strider, right? It usually presents with fever, harsh cough, respiratory distress. Usually it's going to be in kids six months to three years old. So why is that? Why don't adults get croup? Generally, it's because kids' airways are a lot smaller, right? So you can see in this diagram, at the smallest, an infant's airway is about four millimeters. So a millimeter of swelling is really going to go a long way, right, to decrease uh, basically their cross-sectional airway, or their cross-sectional area. An adult, we have big fat airways, we have a little bit of swelling, who cares? Like, life goes on. So that's in general why croup is a pediatric disease, okay? It's a viral infection that infects the soft tissues around the airway. Um, and because of all the different anatomy of kids and the, the different anatomy compared to adults, that's why we see what we see with croup that we don't generally see in the adult population. And we see a lot more in the winter months. It's most commonly caused by parainfluenza, but there are a lot of different viruses that can cause croup. Um, so treatment. Um, your goal is to maintain a patent airway until you get into the emergency department. And sometimes with croup and with these upper airway issues, less is more, right? So you want these kids to be calm. When they start crying and screaming, it all looks worse. It all gets worse. The air, the air that's going in is a lot more. So when it's more air is going through a smaller area, the strider's louder. The respiratory distress is worse. So keep these kids calm, right? Obviously, if it's like impending respiratory failure, you got to do what you got to do. But if they're protecting their airway and they're doing okay, just leave them alone. Avoid unnecessary procedures. If you do need to give them oxygen, this is where blow-by is sometimes good. If if a cannula or a face mask is going to drive them nuts, okay, let the parents hold them. Just do what you can to try to kind of keep them calm. And then obviously this is where your nebulized racemic epinephrine is going to come in, right? So this is going to reduce airway swelling. And it's going to reduce it, you know, a lot quicker than steroids and all that kind of thing you're going to do. And in general, we like to give it when they have strider at rest, right? So if they're miserable streaming and they have strider, but when they're calm, they don't, probably don't need to give it. But if they are stridulous at rest, tired, appearing, working to breathe, then the, those kids all need a dose of racemic epinephrine. And you can give it more. Like if it's not working and they're bad, just keep giving it. Like same thing with albuterol and asthma. There's really like no such thing as too much albuterol in my opinion, but okay. So that was quick and dirty on croup. Anaphylaxis. So <clears throat> there's a lot of different definitions of anaphylaxis, but in essentially there's kind of three criteria. And if any of your patients fit into these criteria, then they're having anaphylaxis. And I think it's important to go over these because sometimes I think it's under-recognized. And when you don't act fast with anaphylaxis, they tend to have worse outcomes, okay? So it's obviously a serious allergic reaction. Uh, it's rapid in onset, usually about 30 minutes after the exposure to whatever they're allergic to. And it can cause death, right? It's, it's a big deal. So you're going to have skin and mucosal symptoms in about 80 to 90% of patients, but in like 20% of patients, they might not. And those might be a little more difficult to diagnose. Um, and at the very beginning of an anaphylactic episode, it's really hard to predict how severe it's going to be. So just err on the side of caution, right? So first criterion is if you have involvement in the skin, so they have hives, their lips are swollen, that, that, involve, that includes the mucous membranes. Um, and they have just one of these other things, respiratory compromise or reduced blood pressure, treat them like they're having anaphylaxis, okay? Next criteria. If you have a patient who has had a known exposure, right, you know this kid's allergic to peanuts and they're exposed to peanuts, then if they just have two of these things, go ahead and treat them for anaphylaxis, right? So their skin's involved, their respiratory system is, is involved, their circulatory system is involved, or they're vomiting, okay? 
And then the third is if you have anybody with a low blood pressure after they've been exposed to a known allergen, you don't need anything else, right? Just give them epinephrine, okay? And so sometimes it's hard to remember how low is too low in a kid, right? There's like so many charts you gotta look up and it's just kind of exhausting. So in general, there's like three rules I kind of stick to. So if they're less than a year old and their systolic is less than 70, that's too low, okay? If they're from one to 10, just take their age, multiply it by two, and add it to 70. If their systolic is less than that, that's too low, okay? And then if they're less than 90 and they're between 11 and 17, then that's too low, okay? Okay, treatment. So prompt treatment is really, really important, right? And anaphylaxis is gonna be more responsive to treatment in the early phases. The longer you wait, the harder it is to fix it. Same with asthma, okay? So delayed epi is associated with fatality, all right? Um, there's really no absolute contra contraindication to giving epi, so just give it, okay? Um, the 1 to 1,000 concentration, obviously. The alpha-1 agonist is going to help to vasoconstrict and increase your blood pressure. The beta-2 is going to help bronchodilate, right? And so it's really important to remember that epinephrine is essentially the only thing that's going to do that for you. Epinephrine is the only thing that's going to boost your circulation. Epinephrine is the only thing that's going to stop your airway obstruction. All these other things are adjuncts, and they're good to do, but they're adjuncts. Epinephrine is the treatment for anaphylaxis, okay? So, and if it doesn't work, do it again. Just keep doing it. You can give it, you know, every five minutes. We put them on epi drips when they're not getting better. So, you know, just keep giving it. Um, our adjuncts, right, so we're going to be giving IV fluids. We're going to give albuterol for bronchospasm that isn't um, improving with epinephrine. We're going to give our histamine blockers and steroids. So I hope that that has become obvious that we're going to give epinephrine, right? So this is just kind of, it's kind of hard with the weight base and everything, but if they're less than 10 kilos, give them 0.1. If they're 10 to 25, give them 0.15. If they're 25 to 50, give them 0.3. And if they're over 50, give them 0.5. Okay, bronchiolitis. I hate bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis sucks. Nothing makes it better. RSV is awful, so just wanted to throw that little caveat in there. Okay, so it's the most common lower respiratory tract infection in infants less than two, right? Doesn't really, it really shouldn't be a diagnosis in an older kid. If you have a kid and you call and you're like, this kid's five and he has bronchiolitis, we're gonna be like, mm. it just doesn't really happen in, in, in older children, okay? And that's just because of their airway, okay? Their airway and anatomy. Um, so it usually occurs in Texas around November to April. Um, it's the leading cause of hospitalization in infants, okay? Um, it's a viral respiratory infection of the lower respiratory tract, so the bronchioles, right? So the small airways that are lined with smooth muscle, and in that area, the infection, you get, they get mucus production, they get cell death and sloughing, and all of that results in respiratory distress and obstruction of their small airways. Um, it's usually RSV, but other viruses can cause bronchiolitis. And they're gonna present with cough, tachypnea, wheeze, and fever. Um, the thing that's kind of hard about bronchiolitis also though is it's, um, it's very waxing and waning. One minute they look terrible and the next minute they look okay. So sometimes it's kind of hard to tell how sick they really are um, when you just have 10 minutes with them or however long you have with them. And then here's just a reminder of the kind of normal respiratory rate at the different ages. Um, one thing I want to just caution you guys about is watch for apnea in the little ones, okay? So the little neonates with bronchiolitis, they'll just stop breathing on you, and uh, you just have to kind of be prepared for that. You've got to have your bag valve mask ready, okay? Um, risk factors for apnea are going to include a younger age, so less than a month old, a history of prematurity, and if they haven't, they're not two months old yet after that. Um, and obviously, if a caregiver gives you a history of apnea, then those kids are the ones that you really need to watch. You need to have them on the monitors. You need to be really vigilant. So treatment, um, like I said, there's really not a lot of good treatments for bronchiolitis. It's all supportive care. Um, you need to really monitor their hydration status. Suction those babies because, like we said, their noses, they're obligate nose breathers, right? So if that's obstructed, sometimes suctioning, you'd be surprised how much better they look afterwards. Um, give oxygen if they need it. You can... You can try a bronchodilator. So the AAP is like, don't give bronchodilators to patients with bronchiolitis because it doesn't help. But I don't know if they're down in the ER like watching kids breathe 70 and like, you know, crumping. So when kids are that ill, you got to do what you got to do. Try it. When kids are that ill, it's not probably not going to hurt them. 
but it is not generally recommended by the AAP to give bronchodilators and bronchiolitis, but I do it, so proceed as you will. <laughs> What saves our, our took us a lot from having to intubate these kids is high flow nasal cannula. So high flow nasal cannula is awesome. Um, so your normal kind of oxygen delivery method, so like a nasal cannula, you get about one to six liters per minute, right? A non rebreather mask, you can get about 10 to 15. And when you're bag valve masking somebody, you get about 15 liters per minute. But with high flow nasal cannula, we can get up to 60 liters per minute. So it's a ton more flow, it's higher O2 concentration, and there is some argument that maybe they are getting a little peep also. So um, this is what we use a lot, and it's really changed practice in terms of managing bronchiolitis in babies, and the intubation rates have gone way down. And then last, we're gonna talk about asthma. So this is, we see this all the time, right? It's the most common chronic disease of childhood. And I trained, I did my residency in Chicago where you know, the African-American population asthma is really, really bad. And so we saw a lot of it and a lot of bad asthma exacerbations. And um, asthma is essentially two problems, right? So your airways are constricted, the smooth muscle is contracting, and there's inflammation. That's essentially the issue with asthma. Um, there's an early bronchospastic phase where they're gonna be much more responsive to treatment. And then the inflammation kicks in and there's airway remodeling and then you're getting behind the eight ball and then it's a lot harder to break these kids. The longer they've been in their asthma exacerbation, the harder it's gonna be to turn them around, okay? So remember that. Um, severe asthma. So things that I kind of look for that, that I always kind of uh, get a little bit more concerned about are if these kids can't talk, okay? That's concerning. If their mental status is waning, that's concerning. I'm sure you guys have all heard about the silent chest, right? So you have to have air movement to wheeze. So it's kind of reassuring when they're wheezing. If there is no air movement whatsoever, then that kid is, you know, border, borderline. So if you're not hearing anything, they're not moving any air, they're not talking, they're hypoxic. It's not as common in a mild or moderate asthma exacerbation to actually be hypoxic because the issue is usually with ventilation, with, with expiring, right? So if you start having a kid that's starting to get hypoxic, then those kids are getting more sick also. There's also some historical risk factors for severe exacerbation. So if you just wanna quickly ask the parents, like, have they ever been in the ICU? Have they ever been intubated? Have, how many times have they been to the ER uh, this year? And how long have they been dealing with their asthma? So those are all things that um, can kind of tip you off that this kid could turn fast. Um, and then in terms of treatment, so obviously you wanna assess their severity of work of breathing, their mental status. Um, give them oxygen if needed, um, and then bronchodilators, right? So I really feel like there's not really such thing as too much albuterol. Um, and a continuous nebulization has sh been shown to be much more effective than, you know, intermittent treatments. Um, you can give them 0.5 milligrams to, uh, per kilogram up to 20 milligrams, right? So give it, just keep giving it. Um, it's also important to remember if you have a really long transport time to consider steroids because that helps us out because that's been shown, early steroids have been shown to help uh, decrease admission, admission rates, okay? And then if they're really an extremist, and I actually had a paramedic yesterday who did a great job with the patient because uh, it's really important to remember your injectable bronchodilators, right? Like epinephrine. So if kids are really obstructed, they're not moving air, the albuterol can't get in to do anything, right? So if those kids, those, these are the kids that you think we're, we're heading in the wrong direction, give them some IM epi. You'd be shocked how, how much, how quickly they respond and how, uh, what a different child you're dealing with at that time. Okay, takeaway points. So kids are usually going to crump because of respiratory failure, not because of cardiac disease, right? Um, if you have a sleepy, drowsy, depressed consciousness kid in respiratory distress, then you're kind of heading towards a danger zone. Um, remember to kind of use aggressive and early treatment of anaphylaxis. Um, bronchiolitis sucks, nothing makes it better, and watch for apnea in little kids. And continuous liberal albuterol in status asthmaticus. Uh, don't, and don't forget your injectable bronchodilators. Mm -hmm.